Senator Scott and Reynolds up with a rounding round of applause. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, Richard, he's a great guy out of, out of Birmingham. Uh, we're going to dispense with all the formalities. Those who haven't eaten yet, just go grab your food, and then we're going to get straight into the program because, as you can imagine, the senator has a, a very, very tight schedule. So we're going to – you all know who he is, the senator from South Carolina. If you don't, go read his bio. But I, sit, sit here, senator, and we're just going to have uh, the microphone behind you. And, uh, number one, I appreciate you taking time out to come. Uh, Senator Scott is a dear, dear friend, and believe it or not, and I want you to talk about this, and how in the heck did you get on six committees? I mean, most senators may be three committees. This guy is on six committees. I don't even know how you have time to breathe. Let me just say uh, a, a quick hello to everybody in the room, number one. How, how's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? Now, before, uh, you know, we, we as politicians appreciate taking credit when things go good. And we sometimes want to sidestep it when it doesn't go so well. But almost everyone in this room realizes that there are no individuals in the Senate or any other elective body that does everything on his or her own. That you have to have a capable, competent, qualified staff if you're going to get anything accomplished. On the opportunity zones, uh, it, it c couldn't get into the University of South Carolina, so he had to go to Ohio State. <laughs> He couldn't get into Clemson, so he had to go to Columbia University. But he is, in fact, in spite of the fact that he was challenged on finding his way to South Carolina, or as I like to say it, Diane, South Kakalaki, to, to get a quality education, he found a way to Ohio State and Columbia University and is really a part of the brain trust of understanding and appreciating the Investing in Opportunity Act. He is Shay Hawkins, my financial guru. So please, let's give him a round of applause. His significant work and investment of time is one of the reasons why the Investing in Opportunity Act made it across the finish line. And without his hard work and dedication, uh, this lunch around the Opportunity Zones would not be possible. So God bless you, Shay. Thank you for your hard work. All right. So we'll keep him around nearby the front just in case there's a technical question he has to answer because I may not be able to. So. Well, they're working on other mics. Let me tell you something, Senator. You have one of the best staffs on the Hill. And Shay and I had lunch the other day. Now, the only problem I have with this character you have, he wouldn't let me pay for lunch. I mean, we're talking about $10, Senator. I'm paying him too much. Yeah. You're right, right. <laughs> but, no, Shay and your chief of staff, Jennifer DeCasper, and your, your executive assistant, Bree, they are just wonderful, wonderful people. And if you all haven't had any interaction with Senator Scott's office, you're going to find them to be some of the most competent, responsive people on the Hill. And so anything you could do to be helpful to the senator, both officially and otherwise, hint, hint, uh, please do so. Well, we're going to have to change, you know, exchange mics while they work on the other one. But what I want to do is give you a, a chance, Senator, to talk about what was the nexus of you wanting to create this act? How did it come to be? And what do you hope to accomplish with it? Excellent. Thank you very much. And I also want to say uh, thanks to my great press secretary, Michelle Exner, over here. Uh, a Naval Academy grad, uh, eight years active duty in the Marines, and now is a reservist in the Marines and spends a lot of quality time trying her best to make sure that I sound good. She says she can't do nothing about making me look good, but she's working on the sound good. So uh, for me, I, I work with a basic, simple philosophy. The stronger your why, the easier your how, and the clearer your what. And so for me, when you think about the Investing in Opportunity Act or the Opportunity Zones, a part of my strong why has to do with where I grew up. Growing up in a single parent household, living in distressed communities all of my childhood, really helped me understand and appreciate why it's important to attract opportunity into the zones. So many times, too many of our young folks have amazing potential, crazy talent, and yet they are under the radar consistently because opportunities simply have not descended upon their neighborhoods. 
And so one of the reasons why I wanted to have a role in investing in the Opportunity Act and creating Opportunity Zones was understanding and appreciating the level of potential that is too often left behind in distressed communities. And disproportionately, distressed communities are also communities of color. And so I wanted to find a way to target our areas, the areas where people like me, now some of you guys looking at the suits you're wearing have been rich all your lives. <laughs> I understand you don't know what I'm talking about, but you've been rich all your lives. But the rest of us who have come from places like, like I've come from uh, understands and appreciates that you may have all the talent necessary to make a difference in this country and in this world, and yet if opportunity does not reveal itself, you may go another unsung hero, another untold story. So the how we make sure that the opportunities descend upon the right locations around this country, the location where 50 million Americans live today, is the construct of the opportunity zones. So we provide a tax incentive, which is a deferral of your capital gains tax for up to 10 years, so that you make a long term, not a short term, a long term investment in some of these opportunity zones. And by doing so, you allow for real manifestation of critical infrastructure, the development of companies, the rehabilitation of neighborhoods, all the manifest in those areas that today are underserved areas. And so as we think about what I think is the most important ingredient in Opportunity Zones is a strong why, it makes how we get it accomplished easier. And the how we get it accomplished is the deferral of the capital gains tax so that we see the manifestation of hope and opportunity in these areas. Okay, thank you, thank you. And Senator, I'm just gonna have a little dialogue back and forth and then before we get them out, we're gonna try to get maybe five or 10 minutes to question sure, them. Sure. And then Shay is gonna stay behind afterwards for you all who wanna get into the more technical stuff. I'm telling you, Shay is the truth, as we say where I come from, Senator Addy, the guy, I'm very impressed with that. Yes, he is Extremely, impressive. yeah. And um, so, what is it, Senator, that we can do as individuals here? Because all of these folks here have various levels of influence throughout the country. What do you need us to do to help promote this and to keep it in the, uh, on the front burner? Well, re realize that the construct of the opportunity zones and the investing in opportunity legislation is not such that we want the Amazons, the apples of the world to be the leading force to create opportunities in distressed communities. It's okay if the companies that have a capital gain want to take their capital gain and reinvest it in communities. That's a wonderful concept and a great idea. But the truth of the matter is that part of the construct of the legislation is to provide individual entrepreneurs, anyone who's experiencing a capital gain, to invest those resources back in the communities where you may have come from. And to me, it's a part of the mission is to talk to small business owners and folks who've created a little margin in their paychecks and who may have a capital gains tax burden to reinvest that burden back in to our communities so that you can see uh, the opportunities manifest. As a classic example, on um, this past Friday, Marco Rubio and myself toured Miami. We did an opportunity tour. <laughs> there you go. And we went to OYC uh, and went to the uh, Mexican American Council we went to the Urban League, we, we went to a children's charity, but we spent time in communities where folks like Alonzo Mourning is making a significant contribution back in Overtown. He, he is looking at areas targeted with the resources that he has made through his time as a professional athlete. He's reinvesting those resources, and he has a $15 million campaign to raise money for kids uh, in those communities. And one of the things I talked about was his ability to go back and talk to other professional athletes, talk to business owners who have who've made well, and talk to them about doing good because they made well. And one of the ways that they could do good is to take that $15 million campaign. If you realize that the capital gains tax is 23.8%, and if you invest in a distressed community and it appreciates, you don't pay uh, additional capital gains on the appreciation. So that could easily be a third improvement Thank you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A third improvement on the type of investments. I said, take your $15 million and make it 20 and go target folks who have the capital gain burden and let's put that back in these communities where you're targeting. And so instead of having a $15 million campaign for the same dollars, just 
targeting distressed communities because of the Opportunity Zone legislation, you can get an additional third. And uh, he was smiling when, when I left, so I, I hope that was an indication that he was looking forward to having a real conversation with entrepreneurs and athletes and folks that he is in his oikos, his natural centers of influence, yep. and bringing those folks to the table to do good work in communities that we need to spend a little more time focused on. Yeah, and I'm glad to hear you say that. I talked with several of my guys in the NFL, NBA, and I sent them the information Shea has sent me on, on the, the uh, act. And what we want to do is probably next month coordinate with your office, and I want to get maybe 10 to 15 athletes on the phone with you to talk about their interests, and then I want to bring them up here maybe in June to meet with you about what, because for example, you take someone like LeBron James, He's doing all this great work in Akron, Ohio, and I'm sure they're probably going to be designated. Every, every governor of every state in the country, plus Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, are all designating parts of their communities or parts of their states uh, as an opportunity zone. And we're using the definition, the definition of distressed communities. I'm going to stand up because I can't see some folks in the back, but the definition of distressed communities is defined through the new market tax credit definition. So we had something already codified in law, so we want to make sure that we use the type of definitions that people are already familiar with and already working with. So that's our, our current definition. Right. Yeah, but, and, but let me just uh -huh. say this. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to, one of the reasons why when I met with Alonzo we spent time talking about professional athletes is because so often so many of the professional athletes come from distressed communities. And it's, it's obvious that all black folks don't come from distressed communities. All Hispanics don't come from distressed communities. Some do, some don't. I did, so when I talk about our communities, sometimes I'm just talking about the communities that I came from, that not all people who look alike come from the same community. So we ought not think of any individual group, whether you look alike or not, as a monolith monolithic group of folks. They're not homogenous. But if we think about those folks who come from those communities who have, have risen to a level where they're making a capital gain, why not target Kids just like you, whose hopes and dreams are pinned on doing something on a court or a field, when in fact the greatest real opportunity for success in this country has nothing to do with the uniform that you wear. It has to do with applying business principles in such a way that you're building not only success for yourself, but you're creating opportunities for others who then will one day perhaps become a success story on their own <coughs> outside of athletics. I, if we can take those, in, in the, the reason why I say that is that uh, the, the school, and you may know the name of the school in Miami-Dade, one high school create, has 23, like 23 NFL players. Northwestern, Northwestern, that's the one, that's what you're talking about. That's 23 multimillionaires from one high school. If we had this sense of civic responsibility to reinvest where you come from, we should be able to solve a lot of the problems that we see. And I think it is incumbent upon those of us who find ourselves in a position to say something and do something to say something and do something. And so for me, uh, too often we're talking about big corporations using the, or, or, or billionaires using the Investing in Opportunity Act as a way to go in and make a, a larger profit and then run away. And my, my theory is it's exactly the opposite. This is legislation that is designed to prevent gentrification by allowing the same folks who came from someplace to go back to someplace and make the investment. So if we're worried about gentrification as a result of having more revenue or more resources come into a community, control the outcome by making sure that the investors have a personal, intimate relationship with communities where they invest. And it's typically the smartest investment you can make anyways is investing in a community that you have a, a familiarity with and you can see the trends in the community because you're from there, you're, so you're paying more attention to those communities. Good. What I like about this bill that you have, I think I'm gonna stand up too. I just, 
So, oh, so if everyone, everybody wants you want to see them, I want them to well, see me. Well, plus, if you if, if you fall on asleep, if, if you fall on asleep while I'm talking, I want to at least know where not to look. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, can, I just can't let you sleep while I'm talking. Sometimes, sometimes I'm a, I got to move around and have a conversation with just just you. See what I'm saying? Sometimes you got to do that. You right, know what right, I'm saying? No just to keep awake a little bit. See, <laughs> sitting back, I'm chilling out. And y'all taking a nap in the back? No, no, no. Now, we gotta oh, just keep keep funny. awake. Got to keep awake. Keep awake. Well, I know, I know. <laughs> I don't appreciate you stealing my thunder, sir. <laughs> so. John 8.32. Right. You're free. <laughs> you come earlier. <laughs> oh, wow. But one of the things that I find appealing about this, I talked to some of my uh, friends in the Lynx and Jack and Jill. You can get 10 of your buddies who have t capital gains that you want to hide. Or, no. You, you know, no, 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 wrong man, terminology. Man, wait, listen, I'm a politician. I'm, a, I'm trying to get reelected. We ain't hiding nothing. We ain't taking nothing for free. Shoot. I get one shot at that, and I'm saying, I'm not two. I so stand corrected. You can hide outside the room, but in the room, we ain't hiding nothing. All right? We're going to pay our taxes. Hey, you're talking to a tax account here. Yeah, I, I, I cannot believe I slipped up. <laughs> I am not, I'm disassociating myself with those comments. <laughs> well, I asked unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. There you go. There so, you go. <laughs> But uh, so you can get 10 and 15 of your buddies if you all have capital gains tax that you all want to uh, invest, defer, defer. I mean, so you don't have to be wealthy. And that's one of the things I like about this. Absolutely, because this is uh, the, the legislation, I'll, I'll reinforce what I've said already, emphasize it. The legislation is designed where something called opportunity funds can be created by an individual or a group of individuals who see the opportunity to invest well and to do good and to reap the benefits, not just for oneself, but for the community that you want to serve. Uh, this is uh, something that it, it has, has, you know, there are things that keep me awake at night. I, I go into classified briefings and sometimes when I come out, it's harder to sleep than before I went in. Mm -hmm. But you don't need to go into a classified briefing to see that the state of affairs in too many communities is in disrepair, and some of the answers to those communities are within our hands. And, and that keeps me up at night, mm -hmm. realizing that too many young kids are losing hope in the concept of the American dream, not because of someone, not because of what someone is doing to them, it's what we are not collectively doing for them. So take 10 of your friends and create an opportunity zone. The Treasury will give us guidance by June, right? End of June, End of June yeah. Treasury will give us more guidance on how those funds will be uh, operated and implemented. But we find ourselves on the doorsteps of real transformation if we look at it seriously. Mm -hmm. you know, let me throw out this as a real world example. Tell me if I'm getting this accurate. Let's say you have an HBCU who is running out of dorm space, and the president of that school calls uh, 10 of their alumni who are very successful, and they have capital gains they're trying to defer. Defer, not defer. defer. Let's say these 10 alumni want to build a, an apartment complex for the students to stay at, privately owned by them, not the school. That can solve the HBCU's housing shortage they can defer their capital gains taxes, and the kids got a place to stay. Is that a kind of a real world example? That is, in fact, a real world example. I, I will say that I had a conference call with, you know, I started last year, myself and Mark Walker, a congress member from North Carolina, started an HBCU fly-in, bringing as many presidents and chancellors together in one sitting and asking, what is your, your number one ask from the, from the administration? Uh, last year, the number one asset they had was year-round Pell Grant. So we were able to get, accomplish their number one ask. Uh, this year, their, their number one ask was to have more interface with private sector, the private sector community mm -hmm. uh, to forge better relationships with HBCUs. We had 70, I think 70 presidents and chancellors come to Washington for that meeting. Uh, we followed that up with a subsequent uh, conference call where we had about 50 uh, presidents uh, and representatives from HBCUs on the line to talk through how to leverage the opportunity zone legislation in a way to improve the quality of life and the quality of experience on HBCU campuses. And one of the examples that we talked about was the housing needs and how easy it would be 
to get your best donors to take a look at adding a third more uh, by e investing in opportunity zones for housing and other critical uh, infrastructure needs. Uh, this is a classic example of investing well and doing good. Yeah, and so that's the beauty of what the senator, senators, and it's a bipartisan bill as well. So he had buy-in from a lot of Democrats in the House and the Senate. And so I'm going to ask one final question to the senator. If you have questions, I want you to line up over here so you can use okay. the microphone. You're going to have a few or minutes. I'll, or I can repeat the questions. That way, if I don't like the question, I can <laughs> make it like that. Okay, like we'll it. defer to him. Yeah, there you go. Um, Y'all think I'm joking, don't you? <laughs> See, Senator, I'm trying to be good, and, and those who know me very well know what I mean. So, but if you're going to open that door, we're going to have a lot of fun before you leave, okay? That's why I'm leaving in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have that much fun. <laughs> uh, I think what, when you and I talked about this a, f a couple of months ago, yes, a lot of folks were calling me. They knew about the bill in, in big picture. But, I mean, I, I think we have to put together maybe a, a really intense media campaign to get this out across the country so that, because when you say opportunity zone, enterprise zone, most people think it's for the billionaire class. Right, yeah. And I think what, what separates you, what you're doing from the others, you can be just a steel worker, auto mill, uh, auto assembly plant work, get 10 of your buddies together, and yeah. you all do this. Yeah, so two, two, two things. Uh, let's separate the uh, conversation. I, I'm a huge fan of Jack Kemp's. I thought his uh, empowerment approach is the model of my legislative approach to governing. It is the Jack Kemp model. One of the things that Enterprise Zones did was to attract more government help and assistance into communities. And it was a, it was a laudable goal. Uh, this is very different than the Enterprise Zones. This does not seek to attract more government dollars, it seeks to attract more of our dollars into our communities to do the things that the government has left undone, which will consistently be the case uh, going forward. So we're going to always have to have a private sector infusion for hope to actually manifest itself. So there are government programs, whether it's LIHTC, whether it's a new market tax credit, there are a litany of programs that will still populate the areas that we're talking about. The question is, if we're, if we're looking in those areas and they're still devastated, the question, what, what, what is necessary? I think what is necessary is a, an entrepreneur's mindset to come in and to create jobs, real opportunities. I'll say this as a small business owner myself for 15 years. I ran uh, a, a fairly successful all-state insurance agency. We were the top 1% in all agency owners throughout the country. I was, ended up on a national advisory board representing all the agency owners. And I, I had a specific focus to make sure that when I leave Allstate, because I never thought I was going to be an Allstate agency owner forever. I knew one day I would sell my businesses and move on to something else. Uh, I, had, I had one consistent theme in my mind that when I leave, let there be more than one to take my place. And so my former office manager, who is uh, Jolita Hill, who's now in Jacksonville, started her own Allstate franchise a few years ago after she left. Uh, African-American female who is now one of the top 10, 5% of the uh, agency owners in the country. Another young lady who took her place when she left was a young African-American young lady named Sherry Jenkins, who became my office manager. I wanted to teach her the ropes. And Sherry was, she was a tough cookie. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> but now she has her own all-state insurance agency in South Carolina as well. And so what I've tried to do is to make sure that success doesn't end with me, uh, if, 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 if there is no succession plan, there is no success. Uh, and so part, part of my vision for the Opportunity Zones is that we start thinking in multiple generations and not simply in seven year bites or 24 month bites and ROIs on just a dollar. If we, if we don't figure out the whole economic triad concept that we're gonna find a way to recirculate the same dollar in the same place seven times there is no long-term success that will actually occur, no matter how good the first shot is, because one, one round in anything does not make a success. So you've got to have sustainable, sustainable business systems that germinate and grow fruit on the tree that is edible. And from my perspective, the Opportunity Zone legislation 
whether it's 10 of your auto workers who have invested long enough to have a capital gains, whether it's you who had real estate and you sold the house and you inherited some property and, and you, you and your family fought over it for a little while, created heirs' property. Take that money and leverage it and create a sustainable path forward. There are a lot of ways to see this, and, and, and what Reynard is doing a good job of is, is trying to peel back the onion so you see the multiple layers of impact, opportunity, and effectiveness in this one small piece of legislation. But 50 governors have gone through the process as of just a couple of days ago at least and, and designated those areas. So one of the things that we have to make sure is that the governors and the municipalities are taking the time to disseminate the information within their communities. I will tell you that I am now getting calls from millionaires and billionaires who want to say, now, that thing that you snuck, snuck into the, the, the <laughs> I, was like, I kept it quiet for a reason. <laughs> they asked me questions about this one. Now, I hid this one in, the, in, in Jacksonville, and, and, I, and it worked out fine. But the fact of the matter is that now folks are asking, can you explain that to me one more time? One more time, and then we'll start opening it up for questions before I have to head out. Uh, this legislation can either be monumental transformation for people who desperately need it, or it can just be another good idea whose time never came. The choice are those folks who have the ability to invest. So whether, whether it's property, whether it's businesses, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a mortgage company in Charlotte that has bought up old shopping centers and they're creating charter schools and they're now looking to create housing tracks opportunities for folks to have transitional housing while their kids are going to an a-rated school and 70 or 80 percent of the, the population are black or brown i mean there are real creative ways to make this thing a success right right give the senator a hand on this before we open up the questions and again, we have no excuse for the folks in this room. We all have the ability to pull together our, our capital gains deferral, and let's do something in the community to make a difference. So we, this bill empowers each of us to have power. Any questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Hey, Don. New York. New York, New York. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And so I know Dr. Riley and the Yes. Yes, so let me separate the two issues because it's really hard to conflate those two together. But it's okay though, because if you have a love for people, I got I got love to have a conversation with you. So I'm happy with that. Uh, I look at it from a Matthew 25 perspective, where you look at the subgroups of the subunits of our people uh, that need assistance, whether it's widows and prisoners, uh, uh, the naked, hungry. So there are groups that I think we have a specific objective to try to reach. At least I, I do. So from a prisoner perspective, one of the programs that have been very successful in South Carolina is a group uh, a group called. Uh, Proverbs 226 group, which what they are basically done, that I've, I've visited two prisons in South Carolina long enough to serve lunch, hang out with the inmates to understand and appreciate the disillusionment that leads to where they are. And how do we rehabilitate and not just house human beings? There's two different focuses. One, one is just keeping you away, the other one is making you better. Uh, making you better does not seem to be the constant uh, stream of consciousness that we find in institutions. 
So what Proverbs 2, 2, 6, 6 does is it reunites fathers, and with both of the uh, sites that I visited were male, male populations only, uh, fathers reunited with their kids. And it gives them a strong motivating factor to understand the power of not recidivating, which is huge. Second is job skills. And so one of the things that they're doing in this, 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 this facility is creating a call center for the, for the, for the men who are in prison. Um, my staff will get you the one. Uh, but, the, but, but literally, the program has created a call center where six or eight of the, this is a, this is a test site, uh, where eight, eight, eight of the folks are able to, to if we're going to send our call centers to India, why not just do it here? You know, so, and, and, and it is going pretty well. And I think it's in Kansas, they are actually, before you get out, you can get a, a job where I think the pay is 10 bucks an hour, and 25% goes for your housing, 25% goes to restitution, and then uh, you know, probably 25% goes to taxes. <laughs> <laughs> can they defer that? <laughs> no. <laughs> and then the rest goes to you, right? So these, these guys are creating, some, somebody, and this is once another test site happening. Well, they're actually becoming a part of the, um, of, of the manufacturing world. They were making like ball bearings for chairs. And they were making 10 bucks an hour. And when they leave, they have a little nest egg of five or seven or eight or $10,000, depending on when they start, which as you know, uh, I've had one of my closest friends spent seven years in federal penitentiary. He's a pastor now. He's been out for about 20 years. But when he started out, he had a Pepsi bucket and a sponge trying to make work happen. But if you had seven, $8,000 when you exit, the transition money allows you not to recidivate. Hmm. So we have to start thinking outside the box and make sure that we don't turn our prisons into for-profit institutions for others, but at least be a for-profit for yourself. And so these are just two examples, one in South Carolina, one in Kansas, that seems to be working. Um, there are other programs as well that have had been very effective. I went to California to visit another one, which is a, I think there's an 18-month program that takes you from your last nine months incarcerated to your first nine months out of incarceration so as to make sure that your new model is sustained. And part of the new model is birds of a feather fly together. Don't go back to them same birds, <laughs> right? So it, it's, you got to find yourself a new culture almost, a new set of friends and family at times in order for you to be successful. It, it, it really is a paradigm shifting experience to reduce the recidivism rate. Okay, we got, i tell you what, we got to get I'll Finley. Say, yeah, shorter answers, I got less than seven minutes. Okay, okay. so we're gonna, we're gonna take, spend maybe three or four minutes, quick. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be faster on my answers. Yes, sir. The large number of uh, blacks who live in poverty exist yep. are Democrat controlled. And yes, sir. Are you finding resistance to accepting this concept in the Bergen County largely because of partisanship? Well, I, I, I am probably the least popular black elected official because I'm a Republican. So, uh, <laughs> y'all didn't know that. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I, I, was, I was not born this way, by the way. I, I got dropped on my head when I was about three years old. I woke up Republican. I'm not sure what happened. That was just a joke. Uh, yeah, so, so the, 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 is, is, there a, is there a partisan resistance to good ideas? Of course there is. But what I've learned is that Cory Booker and I have been doing a road show together where we've talked to the National League of Cities and the National Association of County Officials. And we've tried our best to talk to some industry. So what we found is that by partnering together, we are able to overcome some of that natural bias to folks who may come up with a good idea that may actually be helpful, but they can't hear it because a Republican is saying it. So I've been very uh, intentional about partnering with people who I think will help get other people to pay attention to the message so that it doesn't just come from me. Oh, wow. Ch Ch okay, one more. Make it quick. <laughs> yes, sir. Let's give him more time. He's a, he's a thank you. Shoot, oh, give him got, time, brother. Hey, hey, it's your show. Shoot, take your time, man. Let me hear what you got to say about <laughs> you. I, I feel you now. Yeah, man. I'm Michelle. You hear it? This is the senator Don't now. Don't think I'm joking. Shoot, <laughs> give him all the time he needs. Have you got a call from the office of the governor of Maryland? Yes, sir. That's great news. Absolutely. Yes. 
Absolutely. Yes. I, I, I honestly think if you if if uh, you did a couple things. Number one, I talked to your governor uh, about opportunity zones, and I'm glad that he was receptive and, and excited about it. Uh, I've talked to governors all over the country trying to get them to push the marketing of this legislation because I think it can transform communities. So the first thing we can do is talk to every single person you know. If you've got a, an email list, an Instagram account, a Twitter account, you can say, thank God for Cory Booker's legislation on Opportunity <laughs> Zone. I don't care what you say. But as long as we drive them to the legislation that I am the parent sponsor of, uh, I, I, it doesn't matter to me because at the end of the day, if, if we are pushing this Opportunity Zone legislation, uh, the, the, sin, the disseminating information, we're all going to be better off. So no pride in ownership, honestly. Uh, just, just a pride in getting things done. My theory is Matthew 25, 21, well done, my good and faithful servant. Yep. So I'm going to get mine when I get there at the very least. So while I'm here, I'll take the abuse until I get to where I'm going because I know I'm on a mission. So if you would just take the time to show every single person you ever come in contact with that they ought to become more familiar with Opportunity Zones. And then if you, have a, if you own a TV station, or if you own a newspaper, or if you have a radio show, or if you're the former head of the NAACP, tell somebody. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so just for Ben right here. But yeah, seriously, everybody should be involved in making a difference in the community that you come from. All right, yes, now we, I'm going to go, I'm going to, Michelle, I'm going to take two more. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'll come to you, but come back to you. Yes, sir. Thank come back you so much for the legislation. Yes, sir. Where's your area, sir? Youngstown, okay. Okay, and I'll never know. I'll give it to him. I'm not going to touch it. Let me just say, brother. The governor makes the decision. Okay, so we have to approach the governor. Well, the good, the, here, here's to, to, the good news and the bad news. Whoever said it, said it well. It's done. So it, it, the only question you have now is to, do, to figure out where the areas are in your state. I'm coming to Ohio in about two months to do an opportunity tour. I'm doing a national tour through different areas. But this, this is going to help. And frankly, what happens is wherever the governor designated within the new market tax credit for the distressed communities, the communities contiguous with that can also benefit as well. So we need to make sure that you have a full appreciation of what's possible in those areas, especially if you, you don't sound very happy with those designations. But, but if there's a way for us to be helpful, we're happy to find ways to partner so that you can have all the information that we have on how to make sure that those programs are successful. I, I, I do have, I do, I do, I got to go. So, okay, I'm going to ask you, I'm going, I'm going back to Miami, the, my last question, but let's go right here. Yes, sir. Senator Kinslow, you were a great American. Thank you. You were a great American because you were bringing up the spirit of African Americanism. Yes, sir. The spirit of Antifa. That's all you need. And I thank you very, very much for that. Thank you, sir. There's a, much, a lot of distressed communities everywhere. Question, question, question. The question is most distressed communities that you are very, very concerned about is in Africa. You just heard President. Question, question, question. Yeah, but I've got three minutes left, so I want to get to his answer and answer it. Question and answer it. Well, I, I will just say, yeah. So I, I will say that from my perspective, the last several months, have been helpful for entrepreneurs because we've been able to move from an irresponsible layers of, of regulatory uh, morass to a more responsible level. We will always have le regulations, uh, and most of us who are entrepreneurs will find it to be oppressive regulatory environment. It is at a significantly lower level, which I think is helpful for spurring economic activity, which is positive. I hope we have more of the same. We are working on a bipartisan piece of 
legislation that will make it easier for more banks to lend more money to entrepreneurs and to first time home buyers. Uh, this has 17 Democrats, a part of the legislation, so we're heading in the right direction. So I do think that a, a lower level of regulations, though a responsible level of regulations, is important for us to spur economic activity in America and around the world. Last question. If you got to read a question, that makes me nervous. <laughs> From the from the from the IRAs? From from the self directed opportunity fund because I'm gonna have appreciation and I'm gonna have ongoing income. So yeah. I got so and so in a piece of property and I put a million dollars in, it grows to say two million dollars, right. but during a period of time we're generating the income that would be do you know if the IRS will put some rules that will allow me to read the question? Yeah, so I will. So he said something about something. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard. <laughs> I don't know what he said. He said something. I'm not sure what he said, though. I, just, I heard something. I'm serious. I'm not sure what he said. But let me tell you what I think he said. Okay. Let me tell you what he think he said. Yeah, Shane's going to stick around. I apologize. This is just who I am. I can't help but be me, right? If you don't know the answer to the question, just don't answer it, right? It took me a long time to learn that as a senator. But what he basically said is that if you make an investment, and that investment appreciates, and you want to take money out of the opportunity zone to do other things with it, what is the, what is the, uh, the tax consequences of it? That's what he said. Well, good. I didn't know what he said. Anyways, I'll go back to my blah, blah, blah. So he'll answer the question. We stay with Shane. Let me, let me. You want to add to that? So. No, Shane is going to stay behind when the senator leaves. Yeah, Shane will answer that question. Yeah, yeah. I doubt it. I doubt it. It, it, it. All things are possible, but let, let, let me not. And one thing I, I committed to when I first got elected was always telling the truth. You may not like my truth, but it's, it's, the, it's the closest I can get to the truth. I can't see any, I don't envision allowing for people to make early withdrawals from a retirement account because they have a, 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 an increase or an appreciation and then taking that money and, and doing something else with it because to do so, what you're talking about is not only a 10% penalty for an early withdrawal before 59 and a half, you're also talking about having to uh, claim it as ordinary income, which really makes it like a 40%, a 30%. So 59 and a half, if you take money out of any, any qualified account before 59 and a half, you don't just pay the 10% penalty, you also have to declare the proceeds as ordinary income. So if you're in a 25 or 30% tax bracket, that's a 10% on top of the 25%. Well, my answer to the question is no. I don't think they're going to allow it to happen. So I apologize for being so clear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I wasn't, but I, listen, working with the de <laughs> Department of Treasury to get this done has been a monumental task, and I thank God for folks like Shea, who has the patience to walk this thing through. But for us to then start talking about qualified funds versus unqualified funds, it is a whole new game. Now, there are... Uh, parts of the uh, qualified nature of uh, retirement funds that can be used to buy real estate and other things. That is not a part of the Opportunity Zone legislation. But there is legislation, there, I mean, there, there are regulates, there's, a, there's regulations that allow you to use your retirement funds to, to do cool things with it, but it ain't done very often by many people because if you ever are called to court, Tim Scott never said you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. I, I said, let me get Ben here is the head of the NNPA, and, uh, and uh, Dorothy Lavelle, like the, the dean of the black newspaper publisher. So we'll get a quick picture. Air, yeah. Okay, thank you. Again, Dorothy, get in there. And Aaron, do me a favor, escort the senator upstairs so that he can run, run into any. Oh, I'm looking at I ain't running no problems. <laughs>
right. Shay is going to stay, and we got someone from the White House coming over, too. And you all stay seated because we have a, a, the program is continuing. Listen, Shay, he's the truth. He has an investment banking background, law degree, and just a real, real knowledgeable guy on, on the financial markets. And so since the senator, you know, had a billion things to do, and uh, he, he stayed long when he was supposed to. I mean, he was supposed to be out there like in 30 minutes, but because how beautiful you all looked, he decided to stay a few minutes extra. And I, I always joke when the only thing that make him look good is distance. But I digress, <laughs> Shay, and don't tell him that. <laughs> so, but now some of you all were asking um, uh, Dave and Jerry. I know you all are asking some more technical questions. And 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 Dr. Chavis, what we're going to do if you if you and 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 Madam Lavelle here, I think maybe it may be good to get some of the, the publishers on the phone with the senator to talk specifically about this, and then I can tell you why you know, later on. But I think. Uh, Tim S Scott is a real guy. He's one of our type of people. And I think we need to engage more with the black media and him. So w we, can, we can talk about that. But anybody else have any questions before I turn over to Shay on some of the, the provisions of the, the bill that you all want to discuss? Because he uh, can get you into the weeds with the legislation. If, I tell you what, while they're thinking about this, Shay, tell us, okay, what the next step is with Treasury? I know 20 states, I think, have been approved. 30 got an extension, correct? Correct. So tell us what the process is for the other 30. And so, 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 so just to give a brief overview, uh, you know, the, the, the provision is designed uh, so that folks who have a capital gain can defer payment of that capital gain um, for up to 10 years, provided that they reinvest that capital gain in an opportunity zone, uh, you know, in the 50 states or in the six territories. So just as a, as a practical example, let's say somebody has a million dollars worth of Microsoft stock. And over time, that million dollars turns into two million dollars. So right now, you'd have about uh, a two hundred thirty-eight thousand dollar tax bill waiting for you on that in capital gains. So you can defer payment of that tax bill for up to ten up to ten years, provided that you take that two hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars and reinvest it in one of these distressed areas throughout the country. So at the end of that ten years, you're still going to have that tax bill waiting for you. The difference is that one, you got a 10 year loan on the federal government. Two, any gain that you experience on that $238,000 while invested in the zone is permanently tax free. And so that, 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 that any gain that you experience uh, on the investment in the zone is permanently tax free. Give them, example, give them an example of the apartment complex for the HBCU. Right. Walk right. them through that. Sure, sure, sure. So, so Let's say that 10 individuals, uh, you know, pull uh, $20,000 in capital gains uh, each, and so they have, you know, a $200,000 investment. That investment will go through an opportunity fund, which I'll discuss uh, shortly. And then that, that fund would invest in this apartment complex. So let's say the value of that complex, uh, you know, upon, you know, initial investment, is let's say $250,000, let's say they put the debt in and the equity and, uh, you know, and borrow, you know, you know, to build on that. 
and over you know over the course of ten years or five years or however long, uh, that investment is now worth a million two hundred fifty, right? Mm -hmm. So on, on that million dollar capital gain, you know, which would you know which would translate to um, you know about a hundred thousand per per person, they would owe no capital gains tax on that forever. Forever. Now. Each of them still have a twenty thousand dollar tax bill, yeah, right? right? <laughs> so that that still stands, right? No, 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 no. It's it's just a twenty thousand. Right now, that, 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 now that's a, a one one additional level of complexity. I'm trying to get the big overview first, but but correct. There's a further incentive to encourage individuals to hold the investment for a longer period of time, right? And so that incentive gives you what's called a step up in basis on your initial investment. So that would chew into that, um, you, know, you know, basically so if you're looking at, um, at, at that, you know, let's say the $238,000 investment or the 200 in our example with the apartment, uh, then on the other end of that, you could end up just owing 170 if you hold it 10 years. So even if you don't make anything on the investment, you get something just for investing and holding. Absolutely. Yes. So this, you know, with the difference with this program is that it's not, um, it's not a tax credit program. However, it is complementary to some of the existing tax credit programs. So what, what the boss noted, what Senator Scott noted, um, was that the criteria to determine what a distressed community is is based on the same criteria used in the New Markets Tax Credit Program. Yeah, we, we, we see them as completely complementary. So the New Markets Tax Credit Program is primarily uh, debt. Uh, so this is our program is equity, and so we see them as completely complementary. Uh, and, and so just a quick review. Right, be, 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 because you know a lot of the media is focused on uh, this first phase. So th this first phase was the phase where governors actually designated the opportunity zone. So any governor or chief executive officer of a territory, like for instance, the mayor of DC would be the chief executive officer here, uh, had the ability to designate 25% of the distressed census tracts in their state or territory as opportunity zones. Um, so, um, you know, for instance, in South Carolina, we've got about a thousand census tracts. Um, so, about uh, 500 of those are distressed, and so our governor was able to designate um, about 130 of those as uh, as opportunity zones. And so, in South Carolina, the process was very, uh, very well thought out. The governor reached out to every single. Uh, uh, county and municipality, and they, he had them rank their top choices as far as uh, as far as opportunity zones. So you know when they made their choices, ultimately um, every county, all, all of the 46 counties in South Carolina, had at least one opportunity zone. Uh, the opportunity zones were very well balanced demographically. Uh, you know, very very well balanced as far as uh, you know, as far as voting patterns, you know, I think South Carolina's population is about um, about 30% black, uh, and the opportunity zone populations work out to be about 46% black, 5% other, and uh, and the remainder white. And so, uh, you know, we were very pleased to see that because you know you got a situation where you got a Republican governor who's in cycle. Um, in 2018 here, so you can imagine a situation where people are tempted 
to kind of use the opportunity zone process to, you know, to pack it into counties that, um, that uh, are just, you know, uh, friendly to that governor. But in this case, we saw a great process that was driven by the needs of the uh, communities and also the opportunity representing the communities. Um, and and, and that, that, that was very demographically balanced. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 so we were very pleased, um, you know, with that process. Yes, so, so, so every, um, you know, a, a, all of the nominations from the governors were due uh, March 21st. And so Treasury gave every uh, state the potential to do a 30-day extension. So about 20 states were in that initial batch. Um, and then the, the, the remaining of the states and territories came after. But as, as we understand it, every state and territory has nominated their zones. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I, I can reach out to any, uh, in the interim, I can reach out to any uh, Chamber of Commerce for the 50, 56 states and get you a copy of the zones for a given state. But ultimately, Treasury's gonna post them uh, on Treasury's website and they're, you know, they'll be widely in line. Okay, well, there you go. Yes. Uh, right. So Treasury is working to the, the Treasury Department is working now to set the guidance um, for um, for for opportunities for opportunity funds. Opportunity funds are the vehicle that um, that investors will use to, uh, to to invest in the zones, and that that just gives the Treasury Department. Uh, something where they could say, yes, this is a true capital gain on the front end, and then on the back end, they could say that this is a this investment is occurring within an actual designated zone. And so we were worried that Treasury was going to make the process overly complex. So we said, look, we want the process to be very simple or either analogous to something that exists now, like the CDFI fund process or something like that. And so, yes, so so it was... Well, well, you know, th th this, is, this is the guidance my boss gave to gave it, you know, to make it simple or analogous. And so, in any case, um, you know, Treasury's definitely held to that. And now we're worried that they're not going to give enough specific guidance. They're going to be too hands off. So, ultimately, we want a situation where, again, it could be three friends that invest. It could be a community development organization, a community bank, all the way up to, you know, a Wall Street hedge fund if they want to get involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what another thing that is critical is that any fund can invest in any zone in any of the fifty states or or territories. So you know you can attract money from from other places. You can put together funds that have a specific purpose. I was in in a meeting with the uh, the International Franchise Association. You know, and so you know they they have seven hundred and uh, seven hundred and seventy thousand members all across you know all across the country in, in the United States and territories and so right now we're working with them to put together a mega fund that will fund uh, franchise fees for their franchises right as an equity investment so it makes sense because you know you got these huge parent companies that will have capital gains you've got high net worth franchisers uh, who can actually invest in a business they understand and an investment, invest in, a, in a, a model that's disproportionately successful in distressed neighborhoods, the franchise model. Yeah, a a absolutely. So um, this this legislation was designed with the operating business in mind. 
uh, you know, the, the, the flower shop, the call center, uh, but um, it doesn't preclude a real estate investment. So the whole idea is that you have to make, you know, if you're dealing with real estate, you have to make what's defined as a substantial improvement. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you acquire, let's say you acquire a building, right? Um, you have to put as much invested capital into that building as it costs for you to buy it. You see what I'm saying? And, and you know, and, and that, that would go for any, you know, for any business that's purchased that's already an existing business. Um, so like I said, we don't imagine this will be real estate driven, but you know, we uh, absolutely hope that real estate will be a big part of it. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, as long as the product is being developed in the zone. Right. You know, think about where you would hire people if you were expanding. Uh, you know, we, 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 you know, if those people are coming to work in that opportunity zone, then it qualifies. Right, right, right. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the heart of the business has to be there. And we understand, it naturally, um, you know, if you're a flower shop, obviously you're selling flowers to people outside the zone. Uh, but, but the operations have to be there. So, for instance, I'll tell you something that wouldn't work. If you have a construction business that just happens to have its headquarters in the zone, but they're doing construction in the high-income neighborhoods around the, around the city, that wouldn't work uh, because the because the business, um, you know, the business operations are really happening outside the zone. What would work is if you have a construction business located in the zone, headquartered in the zone, and those, you know, all of that equipment and the workers were going to other opportunity zones anywhere in the, in the United States or territories and working. So, so, so that actually, zone to zone, Activity actually counts. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh uh, well, I I would I may I just want to circle back, just only because you asked the question already. Right, and that, that that was one of the uh, the sort of fresh approaches that my boss brought to uh, brought to this legislation, the participation of local uh, local government in the process, because because we didn't want uh, you know Secretary Mnuchin or whoever's here in D.C. to be determining what makes sense for California or Ohio or South Carolina, and so. Um, one of the keys is that the local governments will have responsibility for zoning and things along those lines. And the state governments have responsibility for what types of business operate in the state. And so we fully expect that you know, entrepreneurs and investors will have to work you know, within the zoning laws that are, um, that are structured for the municipalities that the zones are located in. So for instance, you know, when you think about things like, um, you know, like capital traveling out, out of the zone, as it were, um, or when you think about issues like gentrification, you know, um, that local control is sort of like the check on that that's built into the provision. Say again? Right, exactly, exactly. Yes, sir.
capital gains free perpetually. All, all you would owe is 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 the um, initial investment, uh, the, the initial capital gain that you invested in the first place. Well, uh, up to ten years, you can defer for up to ten years. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and one thing on, on the 10-year point, th the provision had to be structured on a 10-year timeline because that's, uh, um, you know, on the Hill, that's kind of like the, let the scoring yeah, timeline. So in a perfect world, this would be extended, right? And we would have the opportunity, you know, I, I noticed the, uh, the young lady uh, asked about some flexibility with accounting and retirement, things like that. In a, in a perfect world, this would be extended in time, but also, you know, there could be, you know, if we find that there are more efficient ways to bring capital into distressed communities, um, you know, then, then we could look at those. Yes, sir. Right. I mean, well, sure. Right. Right. So, so I would look at it like these are the zones for this ten-year block, um, and you know, Lord willing, obviously, you know. A, a, a distressed community that was distressed at the beginning of this process will not necessarily be at the end, right? And so, um, yes, so we fully expect the, you know, this to change the map. And like I said, if this is renewed in the future, you know, for, it, for, for, for there to be new designations. A right, couple more questions and we can get Shay out of here. Well, it, 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 it'll, th these are fixed for this time period. So, you know, um, the, um, you know, because people have to have some certainty w w w when they're making the investment. So a zone today, for the purposes of this, uh, w will be a zone for the next 10 years. Well, um, look at it like this cuts off in 2028 as of right now. Right. You, you would have to, you would have two years. Well, it, it, as far as the program. Now, as far as your investment, um, you know, you could hold it longer. But as far as the program and the designations of the zone, you would look at it like. The, the zones directly overlap the uh, New Markets Tax Credit Guidelines. So that that's um, a, a poverty rate of at least 20%. Or uh, for a rural census tract, um, the income could be no more than 80% of the statewide average. For an urban census tract, uh, it could be no more than 80% of the metro average. I was going to come back to you. Yes. 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 Sure. Yes. So, so, so Senator Scott gave um, gave two types of guidance to governors. It was non-binding, but this is just his suggestions. 
Um, and so one, we asked the governors to look at need. And two, we asked them to look at opportunity. So opportunity is where the best states, best places in your state where you can turn a dollar into five dollars, right? So, you know, th those stick out to people because the developers are already there. There's folks doing all kinds of infrastructure projects or, um, you know, or, or things along those lines. And so those are known pretty quickly. Um, but then there's also the, the idea of need, which means that the legislation doesn't guarantee that dollars are going to flow in or how they're going to flow in. But the designation as an opportunity zone at least gives it the potential of attracting dollars. And so some, some zones were based on just, you know, this is an area that could really use something. Um, and uh, others were based on the fact that we know exactly which six projects are going to go, and this is going to help get them across the finish line. So we've been seeing feedback from community development organization. I think, I think you'd be surprised. And, and I can take a look at those specific census tracts near Columbia. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've had all folks with all kinds of ideas. You know, the boss mentioned uh, HBCUs. We have, I think, eight HBCUs in South Carolina, if you count uh, a couple of our uh, predominantly minority uh, two-year colleges. And I think seven of those ended up in opportunity zones. And so folks were on a call with us, uh, you know, as the boss mentioned, with just all sorts of ideas um, and, and thought processing from what they could get their alumni to come and get involved in. So, you know, we're, you know, we're very hopeful. It's not a, it's not a guarantee um, that there's going to be investment flowing into every zone in the same way. What it is is the possibility. I'm going to leave a stack of business cards this high. Uh, Senator Scott holds me responsible for everybody being completely knowledgeable on this uh, provision. Uh, so he was being nice to me today, but <laughs> it, it goes the other way if people are not up to speed. So, yeah, there'll be a stack of my business cards and I'll leave them. Yeah. Uh, okay, one more quick day, but we got our guy from the White House, but yeah. we're going to let Shake, plus he's got to get back on the hill. But... Before uh, we take the last question, Shay, really appreciate you taking our time. And like I said, Shay knows his stuff like the back of his hand. And he's, to be honest with you, I'll deny saying this, Shay, but if you really want to talk about this, talk to him versus the senator. Because <laughs> Shay can take you into the weeds on this stuff. The senator, like I said, he's like 30,000 feet. But Shay really knows the nitty gritty. And if you all are interested, Shay, maybe what we can do is, as Treasury gets further down the road and, and make their pronouncement as to how everything is going to work out, maybe we can get Shay, you know, in June, July, we can reconvene and do this again. Just, and just, just let me you. know. I'll be here. Yeah. Last question, Dave, and the question, and we're going to get Shay out of here. Right, so in, in, anything that would normally create a capital gain uh, is going to be seen as, um, you know, is, is going to be seen as a liquidation event, right? And so, again, what happens in the zone is not taxed. Uh, so, so you can take, you know, so you can take depreciation, you can take, take, um, right. Right, so so capital gains, um, you know, meaning you invest in a piece of equipment and then sell it at a higher price. So Treasury has indicated that, um, you know, that's going to be perpetually tax free. They're going to be standing up because, and all that will happen within the fund. Prior to liquidation, yes. Yeah, so. I, I can tell you this, it was my boss's intent that income
produced in the zone prior to liquidation was tax free. Well, that's the intent. <laughs> Horace, and don't be so me, cynical. Me, me, Horace. Yeah, yes. So, so tre but Treasury will give us guidance by the end of September or the beginning of <laughs> July. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. And and, and, and if you read the provision, um, if you read the provision, that's how we read it. So. All right, Shay. Thanks again, my man. No, I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it, Ed. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, and, and for you all, who, if you all don't get Shay's card, I, I'll put you all in touch with him. But, uh, but tell you what, let Shay get out to the lobby because we got our guests from the White House. At, and so, be, listen, 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 listen. Let Shay get out because he's, he's got to get out. Okay, and before we bring up our guy from the White House, let me bring up Aaron Manego. He has an announcement to make. Listen, listen, listen. Everyone, listen to Aaron Manego. He has an announcement. If you all are local and you all want to come to an event tomorrow and Friday, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, many of you in the room are already registered, but some of you are not. So we have a two-day conference uh, taking place uh, at the National Press Club and at the JW Marriott. It kicks off tomorrow at 12.30 uh, with a sit-down lunch uh, at the JW Marriott, about 400 uh, people of uh, Republicans, conservatives from all around the country are convening for a two-day conference. Uh, the second part of the event uh, after the luncheon will convene at the, uh, the National Press Club. We'll have breakout sessions, panels. Many of the things that you heard here this afternoon are going to be discussed to include foreign policy, national security, conservative issues, immigration, tax. All of these issues will be discussed uh, during, during that time. Now, <clears throat> registration for the event is pretty much closed. The, uh, the cost for registration was $100, but due to a generous donation from uh, Raynard Jackson, uh, the people here in this room, uh, only tw 25, uh, if you leave your name uh, out at the, uh, the door on the sheet, uh, your uh, registration fee has generously uh, been covered uh, by, uh, by Mr. Jackson. <laughs> For, uh, for 25 of the other uh, people in the, uh, in the room uh, that would want to, uh, to attend. And it's going to be great. This is really historic. We have the RNC chair coming, uh, members of the United States Senate, members of Congress, uh, international uh, diplomats will be there, uh, business people from all around the country, uh, uh, Reverend Owens and, and the whole contingency, all around the country will be there. This is a great opportunity for you to network, and for uh, uh, many of you that are, are Republicans or conservatives, get charged up uh, going into the other uh, 2018 and 2020 elections. So it's a great opportunity and uh, hope to see you there. But again, please, only the first 20, 20 25, uh, sign your name on the uh, sheet outside. It says impact and your registration fee costs are, uh, are covered. Thank you. All right, thanks, Aaron. And uh, yeah, come on out tomorrow. Now we're gonna move to the last portion of our program and he kind of, went from one meeting to another because he wanted to come by and address us. Uh, Steve Munisteri, come on up, Steve. Give him a hand. He's, he's a special assistant to the uh, president as well as deputy director. You got this long, fancy title, Steve. Uh, deputy director of OPL, which is Office of Public Liaison. And basically his whole job, and, and you can take, oh, you can pull that chair up, Steve, and we're going to just sit and have a chat. And basically what Steve's job is is to, to interact with groups all across the country to let them know what's going on in the White House, how you can be engaged with the White House, and if you have any special concerns or needs or issues, and there needs to be a meeting at the White House, Steve is one of the guys that will say, hey, come on to the White House, let's organize a group of, since most of these guys are entrepreneurs, let's talk about the President's tax bill that was passed, and let me bring in some folks from Treasury, or let me bring in folks from the Office of Management and Budget, sit down and, and dialogue with you guys to address your concerns. So that's kind of a broad picture 
of what Steve's responsibility is with the White House, but I'll let him go into a little bit of detail. And then we're just going to open it up for questions and have a dialogue for 15, 20 minutes. Well, first, good afternoon. I think Raynard did such a good job <laughs> describing it. I don't have anything left to say. So the Office of Public Liaison, we have several missions. One is to identify every possible constituency that we think might have an interest in government policy. So that, that's organized along business lines, trade associations, bankers associations, florists, everything you can think of, along labor lines, every type of union you can think of, along veterans lines, all the different veteran groups, first responders. Uh, in addition to that, every type of uh, ethnic and cultural group you can think of, that it's our responsibility to determine which groups have an interest in connecting with the White House uh, and basically be your bridge to the White House. And then we serve several functions. One is if you have a group that wants to come in and you want to hear about trade policy or you want to hear about tax policy or you want to hear about immigration policy, we try to set that up. Uh, if you want to have an event uh, or participate in an event, then we try to identify leadership from different communities to be there for an event. So. If you haven't, have all of y'all figured out how to get into the White House and affect policy? We just jump over the fence, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I say that halfway facetiously. So really our job is if you haven't figured out how to connect to the administration, it's my job to connect you to the administration uh, if you'd like to connect. So w with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And Okay. Well, let me throw out the first one yeah. to you. And again, thanks so much because he really, you know, juggled his schedule to get here for us. We have, um, like, Dr. Ben Chavis here and, and, and Dorothy Lavelle here. Ben runs um, the National Newspaper Publishers Association, which is a black version of AP. It's over 200 black newspapers. And Dorothy is like a daughter to me. And she's the dean of the black newspaper owners across the country. So one of the things, and, and I've been talking with them, they syndicate my column as well. They've been very good to me over the years. One of the things I think is missing out of the White House mm -hmm. that maybe I'd like to get your thoughts on, there is absolutely no engagement with black media. And that I think strategically that's a big flaw from the administration. They're open to dialogue, sure. but nobody wants to talk. I don't get it. I got you. So I'm trying to be diplomatic here. Hey, you among friends here. <laughs> yeah, as they have it recorded as well <laughs> on Facebook. <laughs> so I don't know how many of you have followed this in the press, but our office has been reorganized. And originally we um, we had Amorosa Manigault was in charge of our well, communications. And Amorosa has moved on. So we we are we are reorganizing our personnel, and one of our missions is, uh, as we finish the reorganization, there is going to be a, a full-time person uh, assigned um, uh, to take over some of the responsibilities that she was she had. We don't have all the people in place yet. We've just we got a new director. I was the, named the uh, principal deputy. We've just added some additional people. It'll probably take another two or three weeks. Uh, in the meantime, I'm happy to uh, directly converse with you. I'm, I'm uh, the principal deputy of the office, and I don't know if, how, how. Are you all familiar how the or, uh, White House is organized? With <laughs> would that be of interest to you at all? All right, so it's really kind of like the military in the sense that everything's by hierarchy and by rank. So on the agency side, you have the, you have the secretaries. Under those are deputy secretaries, undersecretaries, assistant secretaries, and you have like deputy assistant secretaries under that. And those are the folks that, on the agency side. In the White House, similarly, you start with your chief of staff and your assistants to the president. So for lack of a better word, they're kind of like your generals. By statute, there's only 25 of them funded. So those are your Sarah Huckabees, your Kellyanne Conways. I'm trying to think who else. Uh, John Kelly. I, I, I was going to put John Kelly off in a little different category because he also is considered to be cabinet level. It's, it's the only staff that is. So let's put John, or General, excuse me, Kelly, Kelly off to the side. Um, Sean Spicer was one, Omarosa was one, uh, Jared, Ivanka. 
So those are kind of your, your generals. There are about two dozen of those. And they, they are roughly equal to a deputy secretary. And in fact, if there's a state dinner, they get seated closer to the president than a deputy secretary to give you the idea of kind of in the pecking order. So I'd call those the generals. Then there are a deputy assistants to the president. Let's just call those the colonels. That's what I am. And there's two levels of those. I didn't know that before I went to government. Fortunately, I got the higher level because it means you get you paid more. I didn't, I didn't bother to ask. I didn't know. So then you have deputy assistants to the president. Under that, and, and we're roughly, uh, we're over, on protocol basis, we'd be over an undersecretary but under a deputy secretary to give you an idea of kind of what, where you are on that. Although I was happy to find out that on the protocol chart, I would get seated closer to the president than a three-star general or less. So that, wow. I told my mom that. She was impressed. <laughs> <coughs> so under those are what are called special assistants to the president. There's five levels of those. Anybody that's a special assistant, deputy, or assistant, is considered a commissioned officer. We're not like a regular federal employee. So what I mean by that is if somebody graduates from Annapolis, they get an actual commission. You are commissioned into the federal government. You get a certificate. Uh, a federal judge, is that mine? Oh, my God. How? Are we boring you, Steve? <laughs> yeah, the president, Call put him on the phone. Believe me, it's going to be so beautiful. Believe me, it's going to be huge. Diane, I'm speaking at an event. Let me call you back. Sorry, but, uh, I thought I'd impress y'all and say, yes, Donald, but I right, right, right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me turn this sucker off. Actually, in my defense, I had turned it on to keep sending you ETAs on how far out I was. Um, so a federal judge, when they, they actually get sworn in, they get a commission. They're actually considered officers of the federal government. So if you're, if you're special assistant, deputy assistant, or assistant of the president, you're considered a commissioned officer. So it makes things a little different. So we don't, for example, we don't get any holidays. We don't get any sick days. We don't get it. It's like being in the military. You don't get any vacation. You just take off when you can. You're on call 365 days, 24 hours a day. Now we get some perks. I get to free soda out of the White House soda machine. That's, <laughs> that's my best perk. Uh, but every, everything there is by hierarchy. So if you want to eat in the White House restaurant, you can only be a commissioned officer. If you want to go the Easter egg roll and go to the buffet with the president, you have to be an assistant to the president. If you're a deputy assistant, I get like eight tickets when the president's there. And if you're a special assistant, you get like four tickets way far away. You know, I get my real best perk is I get to sit, I get to park right by the West Wing. So if you're an assistant president, assist, deputy assistant to the president, you can park by the West Wing. Special assistant, you're like a block away, and everybody else is so far away, you might as well take the Metro. And so everything in the White House is like that. So uh, under the special assistants, then you have your regular employees. You'll then have your associate directors of the office. So an office like a public liaison, an associate director would handle a particular constituency. So we have an associate director that handles conservative groups, Associate Director will handle uh, um, uh, Hisp Hispanic uh, community groups. Uh, we anticipate having an Associate Director that would just deal with African American constituencies, Associate Director for Veterans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Below that, you then have Deputy Associate Directors, and then under that, uh, you have Staff Assistants. So there's about 2,000 people that work over in the EOB, which is the building next to the White House. And of those, roughly 377 at last count are appointed by the president, and all the rest are, are, are career. So in, in our office, we have two deputy assistants to the president, the director of the office and myself. So that's like having two colonels, but one's in charge of the division and one's not. Does that make sense? And so between my, myself, and the president's the deputy chief of staff, then we have a senior counselor, then the director, and then myself. So that's kind of the order of OPL, and then you have everybody else behind that. So hope that helps in terms of, I mean, the one thing that really helps is when I used to watch CNN and MSNBC, they put all these talking heads on, and any time they, they have a bunch of special assistants, I always thought that, that that meant that was really high. You ever notice that? They all have special assistant to the president. So when you see that, that's like four levels down. Yeah, but the general public doesn't know that. They are imp impressed by that yeah, stuff. So. Yeah. What next question for Steve? 
And by the way, I have my card with me, so if you want to uh, follow up with me, let me start. Yeah, let me ask you this, Steve. While their formula, <clears throat> I think NMPA and uh, the black media, I, I would love to be able to bring them in um, to meet with Sarah Huckabee just to talk about media relations. And, just, and then also, we have to do a better job of availing our cabinet members and their deputy sex to the media because despite being owned by black uh, newspaper publishers, heck, black community is concerned about issues like everyone else, taxes, which is non-racial, uh, education. And so we're sitting on an asset here that I think if the White House just kind of cultivate the relationships, I think we can really get our message out better. So, so specifically with comms and then cabinet. So you can send me a request that you would like to meet with Sarah Huckabee, mm -hmm. and then we can get that to her office. Okay. You know, we can't book it for her. With cabinets, if you want a cabinet secretary to come speak, again, we're kind of the folks you go to if you don't know who else to go to, and then we can make that bridge. And I'll just tell you, if you know the folks directly, if you're, uh, you know, if you, I'm from Texas, if you know Governor Perry from Texas, and you want somebody to come speak on the Secretary of Energy, you know, it's better to go to him than to go through me. But if you don't know, this cabinet says, like, we don't know how to get them in touch with these guys. We don't know how to invite them to a conference. We don't know how to invite them to a, uh, a meeting we're having. Then our office can be helpful. So I, before I forget, the, the second one was a um, oh, cabinet secretary. So cabinet secretary requests, there's actually a division, a department like ours, we're public liaison, there's actually a department called cabinet affairs and they handle all requests if you don't know anybody in cabinet affairs if you send me the request i will get it to the right person in cabinet affairs okay yes ma yes ma'am i think she had a mm -hmm. question sure sure No question. You know, I don't want to be your friend. I'm right, right, right. Now, the other part of it is, there are so many other departments that are studying or listening to what you're going through and saying about his program, but who runs it all? Exactly. You know, yep. It's his yep. issue. They don't engage with us at all. Exactly. Now, we're a big mess, but. Yep, I agree. But we're not all politicians. We're not all one or two percent from Florida and Georgia. We want to let our people know the opportunity. Okay, so let me address those things one at a time. So the issue of, I understand it's not so much you want to meet a personality, you want to meet a policy person. 
that's actually what we try to endeavor to do. I will give you a hint on how it's easier to do it, which is if you, if you write me a note and just say, I would like to come by, it doesn't mean I can't get you a meeting one-on-one -on -one with somebody, but it's a whole lot easier if you say, I have a particular group, let's say you're in media, of uh, media executives, uh, doesn't have to be uh, solely with the African American community, but it's okay if it's only the African American community. Uh, let's, so, so let's just say there is uh, uh, an association um, that you're involved with, that you can get 12 of the board members to say, hey, we'll come to Washington if we, we want to meet on this policy issue. It's much easier for me to get you a meeting if it's for a broad-based association, broad-based community, broad-based group, and the more people you have, and it doesn't have to be 100 people, but it's, uh, so let me just give you a quick example, a couple quick examples. So yesterday we had the funeral directors in. <laughs> yeah, they were all working stiff. The dead is um, there. Yeah. I had to listen to those jokes all day <laughs> yesterday. <coughs> yeah. They said business is dead, but they expect it to be resurrected. <laughs> uh, but they had like 12 people, 12 different regional board members. So I was able to get them with the regulators they wanted to talk to. Um, and then that was uh, 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 fo followed by the Optometrists Association. Well, they were having a, a fl what they call a fly-in, and there were mm -hmm. 16 of them. So I could, I could sell the policy people it's worth coming by because they're from all different parts of the country. So it doesn't have to be 100 people. But if I had just said Dr. So-and-so from D.C. wants to come by, I wouldn't have been able to get the true policy decision makers, because that was number two of your point. You want to have a decision maker, somebody that really affects policy. You're not, you don't care if you're friends with us or not friends with us. You want to cool. see action and results, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and you don't want to. Right. right. <laughs> and and let, me, let me just say something related to that, which is going to be my third point. Uh, I, you pay my salary. I don't ask who you voted for. I don't ask if you're Democrat, Republican. I don't ask if you're conservative, liberal. You tell me you're part of a constituency uh, that's important to a community, and if we're convinced of that, um, because you know you'll get hundreds of people come in and say, "Oh, I'm important," and then they're the you know they're a one-person organization. You know some of those that raise money that way too, but you were part of a media group. You're active in your community, uh, and you said. Right. Black Church of America. Well, that, that, that's, that's obviously important. And, and that is more than just a handful. Right. So, so knowing that, then it, I won't say it doesn't uh, matter if you like me or not, because I'm a sensitive guy. I'd like people to <laughs> like me. <laughs> right, everybody wants to be liked. However, it does, it's irrelevant to my job description as to whether you like me, whether you have the same politics. You know, uh, I'm very serious about the uh, uh, concept of public service. I did a volunteer job five years for free. Didn't take a salary for five years. So I'll tell you where I'm coming from. State Party of Texas, you right? You got it. Yep. So I didn't. Chairman. I didn't take a salary. So, so <laughs> sure. We we. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, well that we Well that now that's that's going to end. Like no, I got you. Well, that that, that ends today cuz you've already made inroads because first of all, all right, give so, him some so, love. Come so, on, so, man. So, so so a couple of things. Answer your question. Can you make an appointment and bring 16 people in to see me? Yes, of course I'd set that up. I'd like the first but 
my suggestion would be, but we can we don't have to wait. But my suggestion is to wait a couple weeks, if one if 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 the interest is just uh, media coming now, if the interest is broader and you're interested in the in the in how your media pertains to issues within the African American community, then my suggestion is let me see how long it's going to take for us to get somebody that's going to be because the plans are to have somebody specifically for the African American community, and rather than have to have you come in twice, I mean, I'll, I'll be there either way, but I'd like to find a time when you can meet with the director and also the person that's gonna be in charge of the constituency. I came over right now because I know we don't have anybody assigned right now, and so I don't want there to be, a, I don't want you to be penalized that you have to wait till we, we get somebody assigned. I mean, I'm the principal director, you can communicate with me, but I would like you to, develop a relationship with a person in our office who can provide constituent services to you. And that's what needs to be done. And listen, it's not it's not anybody's fault in this room, if, the, if you haven't connected with the administration, it's not anybody's fault in this room for not connecting because it's frankly the job in my particular department, we're supposed to outreach to you. Right. Somebody right. should have already done that. Right. And Well, uh, we know so why that didn't happen. Well, no, I'm not yeah, gonna go there, yeah, I'm yeah, not gonna exactly. go there. But, but, <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I just, we're going to look straight ahead and not look to the, we're not going to look in the rear view mirror. I, it's going to be so beautiful, yeah. believe me. So, it's going to be beautiful. You're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> you're not going to get me there. Yes, sir. Carl. Uh, I think it's 20 million a week. Yeah. Yep. Well, it also, frankly, makes our job. I'm sorry. So, so two points. It's not just newspapers anymore. Please know that we have a network of print, digital, and social media. We're not in the dark ages. We yeah. are fast coming up. Everybody's trying to keep like up. Like I said, I had to tell you this is beautiful. <laughs> so, taking your second point about uh, being limited or pigeonholed or whatever. Uh, so first, a anybody's welcome to contact me any time or any of the others. I, I do think it's helpful if there are people that are assigned to specific constituencies so that you know that somebody's working on that constituency all the time. Doesn't mean it's a limiting factor, it's just an extra level of support. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it actually, no, 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 I, I'm, I agree, I'm agreeing with you. I, I practiced law for 27 years and I always said, when you get the witness agreeing with you, stop cross-examining them. <laughs> 
Because, you know, eventually they may change their answer. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, Larry, and yes, I sir. can't see who's behind you. Larry, yes, and then sir. we'll get, out uh, of this, the, get you out of this, Steve. Uh, I got some time. Yeah, so I, I'm uh, presuming, and I can ask specifically when I be get back to the office, I presume it's a combination of our director, new director of our office, as well as our boss, who also is in charge of presidential personnel. So the new director of our office is Justin Clark, who used to be a head of the director of intergovernmental affairs, and Johnny DeStefano was head of presidential personnel. So ultimately, he is probably the most influential person on all hiring, but he's been promoted but the presidential personnel department is still under him. And also we report to him. So I'm just presuming they're, gonna, they're looking at resumes and doing interviews and discussions. Uh, I don't do the hiring, so that's just what I'm presuming. But I'm happy to ask. Okay. But uh, if you have a candidate, if they haven't hired anybody, I'd yeah, just send me the resume. resume. Yeah. I, I'd forward it. Yeah. I can't see who's behind you, Larry. That yes, sir. Oh, okay. And once you do that, you never hear anything back. And this is the problem that happens. They always go, I'm a young college person, pay them X amount of dollars a year to run around and do this, that, and the other. They know nobody. They come to me and others like me. Okay? You need to get somebody like me. With experience. With experience. Yeah. Whose resume may not say that he has experience in doing certain things. But just by reason of being here, and doing the things that we do, we, we had this discussion with uh, Chairman uh, 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 Chairman of the RNC as well just a few months ago, and she was very open to it. But the thing is, is once again, when we see people show up that are hired, they have no idea a lot of times. And then, therefore, you want to be effective in outreach. You can't outreach and do anything unless you have somebody out of that area who you know. Jeff, let me piggyback on it. Steve. I don't, need, I don't necessarily need you to comment, because I'm going to say something. If you want to comment, you can. Let me take you inside, and you may find it surprising, Steve, but I've been black most of my life. <laughs> now, I, now, I know you all find it hard to believe, but I'm going to tell you something, Steve. Let me take you into the mind of the black community. While I know these women, diamond and silk, silk are real popular, most black people find them offensive. It's, it, it reminds of us the, of the minstrel show, the step and fetch it. And yet, I see a lot of conservatives, Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram, throwing them out there, praising them, and they make my job a lot more difficult simply because um, when I go into the community, they assume, oh, so you are just here to entertain folks in, in the Republican Party. And so a lot of the people that we as the Republican Party want to highlight and promote have no connection to the black community. And that's problematic for guys. That's what Jeff is alluding to. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. And again, I don't want to get you in trouble, but I'm just taking you inside the, our community. No, I get it. So, a couple points. Number one, I 100% agree with you that who you have in these positions and what their connection is to an individual constituency or community uh, is vitally important. And if you have the wrong person, you're going to make a connection. And if you, don't, if you have the right person, you will. But second, it's important to check around 
with opinion leaders and people you respect within the community to make sure you're not making a mistake on who you're hiring and that people actually know who the person is. Those are all valid points. Uh, but I'd make a, a point back to you, which is no one can get a job who doesn't apply. Yep, good point. So a lot of times I'll hear, well, so-and-so didn't get a job or something. That, well, you know, if they, if they really, and I'm just talking frank because I'm a frank guy, and I just say, boy, you just told me this person is great. Well, where is their initiative to even get a resume together to get over here? Why are you doing their selling? <laughs> you know, why aren't they doing their own selling? So I mentioned earlier that if somebody has resumes, like I got cards with me, if you think that you've got somebody that would be really good for the Office of Public Liaison, it doesn't have to be for the African-American constituency person. If you think you've got a good person for the unions, we're looking for somebody for the unions, um, uh, they're looking for somebody for veterans, there are all sorts of different constituencies. I mean, there are dozens of constituencies. We're not going to have dozens of staff. We'll probably have like 10 staff working 40 constituencies, so people have to work multiple constituencies. So... Uh, and it, and it kind of goes to your point over there. It, it's not about finding an African, just about finding an African American for the African American constituency. That's a separate issue from there are jobs that African Americans can go into that have nothing to do with the African sure, constituency. Sure. However, having said that, having said that, for the position of the person that's in charge of engaging the African American constituency, to your point that somebody should know the community and be involved in the community and know the players of the community, it just seems logical that it would be an advantage to somebody handling the African-American constituency if they're Afri actually from the community. So those are two different sure. hiring tracks. Whether somebody wants a job handling unions or trade associations or somebody wants to be the person that's in charge of uh, ensuring that... Uh, the African American community uh, is engaged and uh, addressed, concerns are addressed and responded to, whether it's an OPL or another department, people have to send the resumes to. Now, if you send the resumes, and, and, and send only people you really know would be good for the position, mm -hmm. uh, and if you, if you send them in, I will send them on to the person at presidential personnel, and I will send them to my director. I can't promise somebody will be brought in for, for an interview, but certainly we're, we're, they we're always looking for good people. <laughs> for years in the trenches, beating it, getting it, trying to hard your people down. Listen, you have to understand what's going on. This is why it's better to be this way. This is why this, that, and the other. We know, we understand. We're not going to be like some of the people that get on TV and have no idea what they're talking about. You don't want to be a CNN contributor? <laughs> oh, I didn't say Oh, you that. have to bash the president <laughs> to do that. So, they don't have answers. I got you. So, so, you asked a specific question, which is how is it that they determine who it is they engage with? So I'm gonna, I want you to make sure that they set up a system once they do get that position. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to answer your question. Yeah. So, <coughs> we actually, we do have a system, and we do have a process. So, we sit down, and the very first thing is we go to the databases and identify every particular national group that we can within that constituency. And we research who their presidents are, their board members are, or their staff is, and we make very extensive lists and end up, end up 
in the constituencies we've already worked, literally being thousands and thousands and thousands of names. Then the director himself makes a call to like the president of the major organizations to introduce himself to, to get the um, relationship started. And then the associate directors are assigned to follow up with the, the staff and on the day to day. So you start on the national level, but as you're working for the national level, you ask the folks, so then who are the folks in Ohio? And then when you get to Ohio and you got folks in Ohio, you then say, well, who are the folks in Cleveland? And then when you talk to the folks in Cleveland, you say, well, who are the folks in so-and-so neighborhood? So that you start from the top and you work down. Uh, it's, it's a monumental task. There's just on trade associations, there are 38,000 trade associations in the United States. So, uh, and, and our staff's gonna be about 20. But it, it is, it is there, there is a systematic approach to trying to identify every opinion leader we possibly can within a community. I will be frank with you and say since we haven't had a new associate director yet for the African American community, the work that needs to be done extensively has not been accomplished. That won't be accomplished until you get the person in there whose job is full time to figure out who all the community leaders are across the country. Yes, sir. And this is gonna be the last question because we got to close out. Thank you. Thank. You. Well, this is the, hopefully, Steve. This is the first of many more sessions. We can come by and visit with you. And come, yeah. Sure. So, 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 yeah. Yeah. And and look, I would I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be here if I didn't think it was important. So let me tell you. He told you. So you made two points when you're talking about the Republican Party. The other, the consultant. Before we get there, and I'll address the the comment about the Republican Party first. Uh, and I'm going to do that because I'm going to tell you something about myself so you know where I'm coming from. So under the Hatch Act for federal employees, we're not even allowed to help a Republican Party or, or Democratic Party. So everything for us has got to be nonpartisan. So it's not for us about does this help the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. For us, it's about do we do a good job for the administration, the American people, and connect with the community. I will mention, uh, though, being Republican Party chairman for 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 to give you an idea of where I come from uh, in constituency building. So I am the only person in the history of the state of Texas to defeat an incumbent party chairman. And I'm the only person that beat both my predecessor and my successor and got reelected twice in a 9,000 person convention without opposition. When I ran, I ran with the idea that I had no chance of winning because I was gonna be very critical of the Republican Party. And my main criticism was that the party in the state where I am in, Texas, is only one of four states in the union where a majority of the citizens are of color. I don't know if you know that. 60% of Texas is persons of color. There's only four states in the union, Hawaii, California, New Mexico. And that yet when I'd go to a Republican convention, it would be 90-something percent white. Hmm. 
And I would tell people that, and I assumed I was going to lose because my big part of my platform was I was totally retired from my businesses. I just thought I would engage in this, that I would say, if you want to know what's wrong with the Republican Party, go speak to a Republican group, stand in a chair, do a 360-degree turn, look and see what the people inside look, and then go to any of our major cities in the state of Texas, put a chair in the middle of the street, do 360 degrees, and see if the outside looks like the inside. And I said, before you get yourself killed by a car, I'll save you the time. It doesn't look anything in here like it does out there. When I got elected, to my surprise, when I walked in the door of the Republican Party, there wasn't a single person of color working in the Republican Party. So when I was chairman, we established the first African-American full-time constituency work. I hired nine Hispanic Americans to work uh, at the party, seven full-time just to work on Hispanic engagement. I was the first to establish an Asian-American and a youth American, and the end result was we had a 10% increase in African-American votes among male. We won the Asian-American vote, and we won the Hispanic vote. And the reason we, w we did is because we engaged what is a very important community. And, wh and what I said to the National Party, and I used to be on the Republican National Committee, I used to be a senior advisor to Reince Priebus. And what I said to my colleagues there, and I said it in Texas, is put aside whether it helps you win or w lose an election. Put aside the, the concept uh, of that when you talk about whether you need to be in African American communities, you need to be in Hispanic communities, you need to be Asian American communities. Put aside winning. There's a right and wrong, and to me there's a moral imperative that any party, whether it's Democrat, Libertarian, Republican, needs to be in every community. It's not good for society if we don't have parties in every community. So that was my passion. I didn't think I was gonna win preaching that, and I ended up winning. So what, what I'm trying to do in, in the Office of Public Liaison is we want to connect with these communities. It's, it's a passion with mine. And finally, I'll just say this so you understand a little why it's a passion of mine. I was born in the 50s. I'm in my 60s. I grew up in Texas in the 60s. Um, people didn't even know what Italian-Americans were. They wanted to pick a fight because they thought I was Hispanic or that I was Iranian or I was Jewish. You can pick. And all they knew is I didn't look like them. And um, uh, it was a little—it was a little rough in the in in the South in the '60s. And I'm not saying it was as rough on me as it was to other groups. It was rougher on other groups. But I, I've seen the ugly side of that. My my parent, my father was born in Italy, didn't speak English when he came over here. And to me, I think there's no worse worse thing in the world uh, than to treat one community differently than another, and then not engage the community. So for me, this is a passion. So when I got word that Renard wanted somebody to come over and speak, I already had a meeting. As I just found out yesterday, mm -hmm. I cut that meeting short. I'm going here for tests at the hospital for a condition I have. I worked this in. I was sending them ETAs because it's like you people need to be here. We need to be here. And that's I'm just speaking from my heart. I'm a frank guy. So anyway. well, all right, give him a stand. Thank you so much. He, Steve said he's going to hang out for a few minutes. Tell you what, Steve, let's get a picture of, of uh, Dr. Chavis and uh, Dorothy, and then you can mingle with the folks here. Thank you guys for coming.